we welcome you very warmly to our first Swiss Value Day. When we actually, four years ago, uh, started with a Natural Resources Day within SIA, we had such a nice <laughs> story, in other words, success, to convince people that things are maybe not only going one direction. Last autumn, we decided to do, do something similar with the value style. And it didn't take us long to convince the partners of BWM to actually convince that we should do it together. Because to be frank, uh, BWM started in 1997, which was before us because we started in 2002. And therefore, we thought, why not join forces at the point in time where nobody looking at the theme at all? Since then, things have slightly changed, and we thought it's maybe worth looking at that. Uh, don't be scared, you see cameras in the room. So the first part, until the coffee break at 10.30, will be recorded. That is just for your information, so don't do nasty things that you would regret later on, because it's going to be put on the internet and it sends viral around the world in, in two, days, two days' world. Uh, I'm extremely pleased to, to be here with Urban Müller from BWM, and we would like to basically start and go through the agenda relatively tight, because we have a tight schedule, we have a lot of things going on. Our target is to have a coffee break at 10.30, that's the most important goal. <laughs> And then, finally, the launch at, at 1 o'clock. Now, I don't want to wait or keep you waiting much, much longer. I would just like to stage the floor a little bit. I wanted to show you this picture. What you see here is actually MSCI growth relative to value since 1974, more or less almost 50 years. This Matterhorn here, was a TMT bubble for the one of you that are old enough to remember that, but if I'm looking in the, in the room, uh, not a lot of you have experienced that. And we were now climbing the Mount Everest. Looking at it differently, just first class statistic, just focusing on the last 20 years, mean plus minus two standard deviation bands in the year 2000, we were at 1.8 standard deviation. You know how high we were? It's standing there. Five sigma. Five standard deviation away from the mean. In the insurance world, it would mean it's an event that occurs only once every 4,000 years. Now, of course, this time is different, blah, 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 blah. We think it's still worth to look at things the old way. With that, I would like to hand over to Urban to look at different regions and sectors. Thank you very much, Alex, and a warm welcome from me as well. It's great to be here. Thank you for the initiative. We really appreciate it. Um, as Alex mentioned, um, I'm delving a little bit into the um, global um, universe by looking at regions first. You see, uh, on one hand, um, US and then Europe, um, Europa in Greek and Latin, but certainly not in English. Um, basically, um, what you see here is valuations of indices. On one hand, on the left, you see uh, the United States, and then um, for Europe, um, the valuation both of the growth indices and the value indices. And what's interesting isn't so much that there's a gap in both regions. You've seen that from the global um, picture that uh, Alex drew. What's interesting is that the picture deviates to some degree. Um, valuations for growth are still fairly high in both regions. Um, but historically, on an absolute level, you can see that the P-E ratio uh, in the US for value is fairly high to its own history. It's low relative to growth. Uh, whereas in Europe, interestingly, uh, the valuation um, of value is somewhat average or below average, and that's versus its own history, and it's quite far away 
uh, from growth. So not surprisingly, also, um, from a bottom-up perspective, when we uh, went fishing and are going fishing for value opportunities, we quite often land in Europe. Now, um, in terms of growth, what's interesting in the US is that from our perspective, um, there's quite a way to go uh, in terms of correction. This picture looks at um, growth expectations from analysts. It's an aggregated number. It's the expected change in growth in, um, in the future on aggregate here for the MSCI growth index. And fascinatingly, what you can see is that still this is at the end of April, which is not that long ago, analysts in aggregate were expecting growth in the US to continue at a pace that was 1.1 standard deviations above the historic um, mean, which uh, for this particular data set goes back to 1996. So um, even in April, analysts were still very optimistic in terms of how uh, growth prospects might look like. We beg to differ. You might have your own view. It's an interesting picture, we think. Now, this one looks at valuation on a uh, sector-specific basic. It takes a little bit of explaining, so let me try and do that. Um, effectively, um, the bars show the ratio of valuation of expensive to cheap stocks. The way expensive is defined as the um, top most um, the top third most expensive companies in each sector. So that's the expensive part. And then that's divided by the valuation as expressed by price to fair value of cheap, in this case, uh, the bottom third or tercile. And that's a ratio across the whole universe. Uh, typically, growth is valued about three times more than uh, value, as on this particular metric. Um, and then what you can see we show the medium for each one of these sectors, which is usually just below three. Um, and then there's a range. This is 90% of the observations within each sector going back to 1990. That's the bars. So that's the historic picture for each sector as to how valuation ratios have varied over, um, uh, over time. And then the most interesting uh, point from my um, point of view the, um, the orange diamonds are effectively where we are today. So it's the ratio of valuation of expensive, of expensive over uh, cheap stocks in various sectors. And I find it fascinating that as at the end of um, March anyway, we were still in the top third of highest observations of this particular ratio. Uh, meaning that for all of these particular sectors, there are some variations and they are of interest, but Overall, across all of these sectors, you are still in the top third of valuation um, differences between uh, growth and value. And so from our perspective, there's still some way to go. And with that, I'd like to hand back to Alex for a stock-specific picture. Absolutely. Uh, this is a chart that I like a lot. It's actually done two years ago for the Swiss Fund Fair. And I actually plotted here on one hand the share price of Netflix, and on the other hand, the earnings of Netflix and the expected earnings. And two years ago, I stated at the fund fair, at the, our presentation, Netflix is price for perfection. You have to look two years out, and it's traded at the 40 multiple, two years out. <laughs> so it actually assumes that the company grows 25 to 30 percent over the next 10 years. If you do that, Netflix almost owns the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. And you know, if you have been old in, long enough in the industry, you have seen that already once, at least. <laughs> in my case, it's only once. Now, if you look at the same chart today, it looks like that. What's fascinating is the fact that you still have the earnings expectation from the analysts still quite, quite growing. Now, I contrasted that Netflix chart with a company called Tech Resources, which is in the mining space, two years ago, you could basically buy the share within the earnings floor. And nobody was interested. People were hating mining. They said, it's a devil. That's the chart today. And what's even more fascinating, look at the earnings expectation of the analysts. And how can earnings go down if we are running into a shortage of some of the metals they are producing? 
to us it's very interesting and that should have staged the floor and keep you interested and motivated, hopefully for the next presenter, because I'm now going to switch our presentation to the one of Georg von Wies. And I'm extremely pleased that he accepted my invitation to be a co-host of this event. The floor is yours. I think I don't need to introduce Georg von Wiel. Von Wies, I mean, he has been in there a founding partner of BWM. And uh, yeah, I think in Switzerland, everybody knows him anyhow. I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to do the boring part. Um, thank you very much for coming here and, and um, toughing it out for the next 15 minutes. I'm going to show you a little bit about, some, give you some basics on value investing. Um, and that's all about intrinsic value and discounts. Those are the two concepts that at the end of the day are what, what sort of what separate us um, from other investment styles. Um, so let's do a little um, review of the basics. Every company has an intrinsic value. I'll get to that in a second, what exactly that means. Um, that intrinsic value, if it's a good company, will go up over time. And then share prices will fluctuate around the intrinsic value. Now, normally, share prices are on the intrinsic value. If the market is working well, then the stock price will reflect the value of the company. Um, and we're looking for the exceptions. We're looking for those cases, and, and the guys at SEO do the same thing. We're looking for the cases where the market is getting it wrong on the downside. Um, so the idea, of course, is um, we not only profit from the increase in the intrinsic value, but we also click too fast. But we also um, get, make money because the market closes that valuation gap over time. So we have two effects going for us. Value creation plus, in a sense, the efficiency of the market reasserting itself. And that's the key. Um, we think that the markets are weakly efficient. We think that the markets get it right most of the time for most stocks, but sometimes they mess up, sometimes they get it wrong, and that's where we get interested in the company. So how do we determine intrinsic value? Well, um, the way the process works in a very brief way is you, you first look at a company and you have a rough idea of what it's worth. If you tell me it's trading at 30 times earnings, it's got net debt to EBITDA of six times, and it's growing 3%, I'm probably not interested. But if you say that it's growing at 3%, it's got net cash, and it's trading at eight times earnings, then I'm very interested. So you have a rough idea of what it might be worth just based on a few numbers. Um, and you start looking at the company. That means you uh, capture all the historical data, and we just do the normal everyday thing that securities analysts do, uh, the way we learned it in financial statement analysis. So you look at the, the, the past to try to figure out where the company makes money, how it makes money, with the idea, of course, that you try to model the future on that basis. But at that point, you just have a lot of numbers. And to put those into context, to round out the picture, to make the numbers tell a story, not in the sense of a story that a broker will try to, to sell you something exciting, but to just to give them life, if you will, you need to talk to the company, um, you need to talk to competitors, you talk to former employees. We do all of that to, to try and get a, a, a rounded, rounded picture of the, uh, of the company and whether or not our model for the future is actually right and whether our estimate of the intrinsic value is right. So then we have the intrinsic value estimate. Um, now, the basis of it is to look ahead three years in our case. So we say in three years, the company is back into a normal situation. Most of the time, when we look at a company today, it's not normal. Um, something is, is weighing on the share price. Maybe it's a, re a recession or the threat of a recession, depressing expectations or whatever it might be. So you look through that and you say, okay, under normal circumstances, the company, company will earn X. And then um, we also assume that in three years, the company will have a normal multiple, that the market will value it correctly. Um, that gives you a, a fair value in three years. You discount that back to today, and then you have our, the estimate of intrinsic value at, B, at BWM. Um, of course, we also check that with a discounted cash flow analysis, which is essentially doing the same kind of thing with a different tool. So if you take one 
one word away from our presentation is normalization. We assume normalization um, in everything to, to get to the intrinsic value. And it turns out the intrinsic value is usually pretty close to takeover values. When our companies get bought out, which happens once in a while, um, it's usually at a price that's not too far from, from where we think the intrinsic value lies. Um, and so it's also the private market value. So um, we're doing the same kind of work that an investment banker will do for a company when it's trying to make an acquisition, or private equity people do wh when they're looking for targets. Um, once we have the intrinsic value, we try to buy at a 40% discount to the intrinsic value, which is our slogan, you know, 60 cents on the dollar, which I stole from my old boss, Michael Price at Mutual Series. Um, so um, that gives us the margin of safety against mistakes, um, bad luck, all those kinds of things, um, and it gives us the additional, retur additional expected return. And then... Um, we're quite primitive when it comes to um, buying and selling. If the company reaches the intrinsic value, we'll sell. If um, we have, um, if the company has gotten very large in the portfolio, but it's the only one that's not so undervalued, but we have a better idea, we might switch or, or shave the position. Um, but basically, the key question every day when you're deciding whether to buy or sell is, is what's, it, what's it worth? What's the intrinsic value? That's another thing Michael Price used to do, EJ. What's it worth? But that's, that's, that's really what it's all about. And of course, over time, we'll um, monitor the intrinsic values and adjust them as necessary. Um, so that's most of what we do as analysts during the day then, is, is updating ourselves on our companies and seeing if our estimates are correct. Now, I'm going to smudge the picture a little bit. Now, I've been talking about the intrinsic value as one number one specific number, but of course it's not. It's a range of numbers, because you have risks. For example, we might have a recession. Nobody knows yet if we're going to have a recession in the next 12 to 18 months, but we might. So it's stupid not to reflect that in your valuation, to value the company as if we have a recession. That usually means we lose a year to year and a half of earnings or cash flow in a very cyclical company. Then we have problems in China. We're deeply worried by the supply, supply chain um, implications of the Chinese lockdowns, these rolling lockdowns that they keep uh, having. Um, we don't really know how to model it, but we have to take it into account in some way. We have to keep it in the back of our minds. It's, an, uh, it's, an unknown, it's a known unknown. Um, that's a worry. And then, of course, a biggest risk is always financial leverage uh, in the United States that can lead to companies um, going to zero from an investor's perspective because of Chapter 11. Um, in Europe, we're in a better position because companies will, will do rights issues, so you have to take the risk of dilution into account. But in both cases, you always want to keep this in mind. In our case, we try to um, eliminate it from what we need to worry about by just saying we don't buy companies that are very leveraged. In the end, you end up with a few companies that are leveraged anyway, because they leverage themselves while you own them. Uh, we have a case like that Foresia right now, which bought something and then the market fell apart and now they're leveraged, they have to get out of their debt situation, but we were grateful that we bought it when it was not leveraged. So. Financial leverage um, is, is a risk that we're very aware of, and we try to just avoid companies where it's a real problem. Well, but there are opportunities. Let's not be too negative. Um, sometimes companies have new products. ACFA, which we've, been, which we've held forever, has developed the membrane for um, electrolyzing green hydrogen. So if anybody wants to make green hydrogen in this room, they have to go buy the membranes from ACFA. And that's going to be a growing market over the next 20 years as we decarbonize. It's not really reflected in the stock price because it's very hard to estimate how much that business is going to be worth. But it's worth something. Um, then we've got corporate action. Uh, ProSieben South Eyes is, of course, the TV station, but they also have an enormous portfolio of, um, of joint ventures and websites and things like that. Um, Parship, um, um, eHarmony are two dating websites. There's some e-commerce websites in there. Sometimes they sell some of that, and that crystallizes the value. Then you've got... Uh, 
consumer tastes can change. If you buy a company like Fossil, which has, at the moment, is, is suffering from, um, as we'll hear later on today, is suffering from the fact that people aren't buying as many fashion watches. Well, gosh, they were in fashion once, maybe they'll be in fashion again. It's not something to discount completely. And then we've got legal wins. Um, things that are very hard to estimate, but Aircap, which we also own, has written off all of its airplanes in Russia because it can't repossess them. But it also has lodged, um, lodged uh, claims with the insurance companies. So now they're going to fight for the next few years about how much to pay out. Our valuation assumes they get zero. So if they get anything at all, that raises their intrinsic value. So even if these options are out of the money, we want to take them into account because they still have value. And that gives us, um, and, 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 and never forget that companies sometimes have more upside than we think. Let me give you a specific example. This is Krones. It's a position that we're essentially have sold. Um, here you see over time our estimate of the intrinsic value. And you see how in 2020, as COVID hits, we reduce it because we become more careful about prospects in general. Everybody does this, right? It turns out then that um, people do need to buy bottling plants. So our, my colleague Lars Selsos then gets to raise the value, which actually reflects the increase in intrinsic value that I mentioned in the beginning. But in between, we were careful. In the red bars here, you see where we buy or sell if it's below this line. And the stock price, of course, is the squiggly line. So we buy a big position when it's at an almost 40% almost discount. Um, we have to sell some here because we have redemptions, because everybody's terrified um, of COVID. And then here we sell as this, most of the position as the stock is trading fairly close to the intrinsic value. But we always have the, the, uh, the high and the low cases in mind. These come in over time as we get a little more comfortable with the situation. Um, we have them in mind and that makes it easier for us then to make the decision to maybe sell this, buy something else or keep a little bit of this or whatever. Just because sometimes you may have companies that are, have a higher discount that are cheaper at first glance, but maybe they're also riskier. Um, so, you know, it's a complex process at the end of the day, even though you're working with just the intrinsic value as the key number. I think the intrinsic values haven't mattered at all for seven years, but they're mattering again now. Uh, so this entire thinking in terms of discounts, what companies are really worth, um, is, is, is coming back. Um, and that's why we invited you. Um, the reasons it's coming back, our interest rates are going up. So we have an, a correction in expensive stocks. Um, people are now realizing that it is possible to lose money with Apple, with Microsoft, and it's certainly been very possible to lose money with some of the snowflakes and things like that of this world. At the same time, higher interest rates are drawing bond investors back into the bond market where they want to be. They fled into stocks and bought high dividend paying stocks without paying attention to the valuation. But now they're back um, home or going home. Uh, that's causing selling pressure in the stock market logically. But um, it, if, if we get just some of that money coming back into value, it's going to be wonderful for us. And then, of course, as I kind of said before, mega cap tech has run its course. Um, it's, they're no longer one-way bets. They've lost their momentum, and we've had the, the, the popping of the speculative tech bubble. So what's basically happening is the markets are becoming more efficient again. They haven't been for seven years. People have just bought momentum. It's been the pure casino mentality of we buy what's going up. We, 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 that's the chip we want to own. And now they're going back to saying, gosh, maybe this is cheap, maybe it's not. Uh, let's buy the cheap stuff. And there's the disclaimer, which means that none of it, what I just told you is true. Um, <laughs> okay. We will do the Q&A session of the fire chat because we'll have the speakers up here and then you can actually shoot all the kind of questions you have for them. With that, I would like to ask Marcos Hernandez on the stage. Marcos is our CIO and he's a partner at SIA and he's with us since 2007. He has been at Merrill Lynch for many, many years as a sell-side analyst before he managed an internal value fund on the trading floor with Nostra Money of Merrill Lynch. Floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. 
Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming. It's uh, it's uh, very happy to have all of, all of you here. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit recap, historic recap on value investing. So it's not really uh, kind of uh, something that you can study in the university, but value basically starts in the beginning of the 20th century, 1920s, 1930s. Uh, so one of the you know leading intellectuals there was Benjamin Graham, uh, money manager over there, and also professor in the university. So you know, there's many people around value. Value is not only Benjamin Graham, but I think Benjamin Graham is one of the you know top top uh, names to to highlight here. He wrote a couple of books, Security Analysis in 34, very dense and very technical. In the Intelligent Investor uh, near 1950, which is much easier to to read and, and very recommended uh, to read. And you know, he states everything that we're using now: intrinsic values, margin, margin of safety, and how to deal through the financial statements. Many people have followed this school. So Buffett was a, an alumni of uh, of Graham, Charlie Munger, Walter Sloss, uh, Brown, T.D. Brown, Julian Robertson. Greenblatt, even there's a Spanish famous uh, Paramés. All these guys and many other that I'm missing here have been followed, uh, following the, the value school. So just a word here, beginning value was very kind of quantitative and easy. So these guys were through the pink sheets, looking to numbers and looking at cash, looking at booth values, uh, low PEs and, and very you know easy because uh, opportunities were abundant then. And, and they were making good money, but this doesn't last forever because the market is now much more efficient. So market there was in the beginning, and, and now it's more complicated to do this type of stuff. Just one sentence from Graham, you know, to see how deep, uh, how, how deep uh, the, the, his thinking was. In the short term, the market is a voting machine, momentum, and in the in the long run, it's a waiting machine. So really, in the long term, what counts is cash flow and prospects. Now, how strong the company, the company is. Second message for me, value works. So I've been able to go to the MSCI uh, World Value. So this is an index built by, by these guys. This index only starts in 75, so I couldn't go earlier. But if you take 50 years, it's a 9% annual growth. So value works. It's a 9% per year is a good performance. If you take longer, longer data and you look at the market globally, the market does 6-7%. Uh, since the beginning, so the global market, global equities, it's a six, you can expect six, seven percent per year. This is natural because it's close to GDP, nominal GDP growth. You cannot really grow much more than what the world grows. And you know, very long term, term uh, trends. Sorry, so 20 years of, of value cycle, 74 to 97 more or less, with uh, two points of outperformance versus growth, two points per year, which is a lot. And then in the last decade, from 11 to 20, 20, 10 years of growth as George was mentioning. So we've been there, you know, the value guys, we've been there uh, waiting to, to see this momentum fading, and we think the momentum is fading now. Let me decompose value in two different aspects, but this is only one lens, one, one approach. There's many approaches, but there's a quantitative value or, you know, this count to intrinsic value, which is really easy to make, is in the beginning. So this goes to Graham, to Warren Buffett in the beginning. You take the financial statements, you calculate an intrinsic value, which is very easy, uh, basically on historical margins, uh, on historical numbers, sorry. You can even build DCFs, net asset values, apply market multiples. This is a pure quantitative analysis. But then, you know, over the years, over the decades, to value has been coming a kind of a strategic analysis, qualitative value or competitive analysis. So here, I think the perfect example is when Charlie joined Warren Buffett, and over the years, uh, the cigar butt philosophy of Warren evolved towards buying quality. So there's a mix between a value and quality. So here, the difficulty is that numbers are very clear. Everybody lo loves maths. Everybody loves complex models. And when you see an Excel, fantastic. You think the IRR is this, and the valuation is that. And the qualitative analysis is much harder to pass. You know, when you're saying this company is good, why the analysis is less strong, you have no number. But in our opinion, qualitative is as important or more than the numbers. Let me see it on a different perspective. So I have a, another way of seeing value would be dividing it in, in two, even three. So what is pure value? You take the traditional numbers or historical numbers. So then you don't have to imagine anything about the future, be agnostic about the future, and value the company on the past three years. 
So basically, this is very easy. You apply a low multiple of the results of the past three years or the price to book. You buy the cheapest stuff and you wait. So this is basically the beginning of the of value, and this is Warren in the beginning was doing basically this. Then there's another step when you can converge value. What is converge value? Converge value is you look at the past and you look at the highs and the lows and you try to see what is going to be the average for the future. So this is what we call mid-cycle or converged valuations. So you can calculate an IV, which is a bit more, it's the next step of pure value, and you try to see where the company is going to grow X, 5 or 6%, this company, the margins are these or those, and the returns are these or that. And then you can even do a quant. So if you are, you know, an IT uh, competitive guy, you can do you can model pure value and you can model normalize and converge value because all of these are numbers. Even converge value, you can take the past and you can calculate the average and do the future and a machine can do it. So this is kind of the traditional, in our opinion, value investing. And this is what we think is the final step is our kind of makes difference between SIA and other value guys is that we add a strategic layer to this value concept. So we analyze a sector, competitive competition, entry barriers, historical returns. We have been able to even to find a regime changes. So when you find a sector which is very uh, returning very low returns and then something happens like concentration, the sector changes and then returns move up. This is the way to make uh, really big money, find sectors that are changed, also to lose money, to find sectors that are changing the regime. With this card, uh, we really don't touch uh, weak business models. We learned this in 2008, 2009, so we don't want bad businesses because they have a lot of negative options that end up materializing. And there's a big mis misconception in our opinion. So obviously we buy good businesses and the, the big misconception for us is the split, the neat split between growth and value. There's a clear overlap in growth and value. So we value companies assuming this or that growth and we buy at a discount, but we also can buy uh, growth companies. We have Visa in our portfolio and Visa is a growth company, but this growth is very visible. So we are able to pay higher multiple, and for us, it's a discount to intrinsic value. And this is a problem. This is, in the end, all this is very, very nice, but the important thing is the execution. What this means is that the important thing is within the bucket of growth or within the bucket of value if you are a good selecting company. So you, you may be value, you may give me growth, whatever you are, in the end, you need a good analysis, you need execution, you need discipline in the due diligence, apply a discount, talk to the companies, as George was saying, talk to the suppliers, uh, think again and again and touch the numbers. So it's really uh, the execution is key. Then you need to choose the stocks, right? We are stock pickers here. Uh, value is difficult because we are always a bit contrarian. Normally, companies are cheap when they have a problem. And we try to understand is this problem is just short term or structural, and this is the key. If the problem is structural, we can buy. If not, we don't buy. And again, luck, luck is, is really important and it has, a, it has a, an impact here. Just uh, moving to SIA funds, very, you know us, so it, we are a small boutique uh, based in Lachen, value obviously, long only, no strange things, uh, small team, eight people, four investment professionals that have more than 25 years experience, everyone. And the classic has returned a 9% annual for 20 years, 10% return for the last 10 years. So this is our target. We don't want to take too much risk, and we think we can do a 9 to 10% per year. Investment philosophy, very easy. We look ourselves as long-term investors, entrepreneurs. Um, we split the investment in two ideas, capital preservation and decent return. We don't want to lose money. We are very concentrated, so we cannot really make mistakes. We try not to make mistakes. We are the kind of guys that if the stock goes down, we buy and we buy and we buy and we buy more and more. So we cannot really have a mistake in the fund because it can be very, 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 very painful. Um, and in the end, we are always uh, looking at good businesses and trying to buy them at a discount. Our principles, very easy, I go fast, good businesses, good businesses, good management, you know, we've been the, the, the we've seen you know, many, many times how a bad management, not focusing what is important, can do to a good management and it's not good things. Long term view is the only way, sorry, you can take one idea here from today is long term is the only way to invest in equities, long term. 
uh, even more than five years because you know things tend to materialize over, over the, the long term circle of competence this is obviously a core value the right price means discount to intrinsic value we do our strategic analysis which we think it's a little bit different from other people obviously we do financial analysis so we do IRR and intrinsic value for every stock we have and then we can calculate what is the RRR and the IV for the fund so we are able, able to tell you if the fund is cheap or not where the trading range historically has been and we are very transparent on that so we are very disciplined we we don't speculate we don't think if the market goes up or down or recession or not we have our view and we try to transmit our view but we don't care the book is prepared for downturn and we will survive we don't do leverage we hate leverage we don't do derivatives and other funny so it's very transparent and quite boring to be honest it's a kind of holding so how a couple of minutes if i may on the portfolio um so no index fundamental analysis, the weight in the sectors depend on opportunities, so we don't track anything. We are fully invested and very concentrated, 30, 35 companies in the classic. And basically, um, yeah, we don't, we don't change that much, but we are very diversified by currencies, by geographies, by businesses. So even if we have only 30 companies, if you look through the companies, we have maybe 10 or 15 different sectors. And this is a bit different uh, see, uh, from other people in value is the way we build the portfolio, which we want to be very, very resilient and cross recessions. So for us, category one is risk free. Category one companies are kind of risk free. Nestle, Unilever, McDonald's, Coca-Cola. You build a basket of this one and it's easy to calculate what is the return. If they have no problem, normally they trade at an 8% return which is dividend yield plus growth, more or less, okay? And to that, we add uh, layers of discount. So category two, two would be very solid companies like Salmon Farming or Devro that we will present today. Uh, these are potentially Nestle's, but on a second level, we ask for a 12% entry. Then we go to category three of risk, which would be cyclicals. We want 14% return to buy. This means buying below 10 times earnings. Category two would be buying below 15. Category one would be buying below 20, more or less, okay? And then category four is high risk, and here we want to double. Normally, we never have more than 10% in categories four because risk is something that the quant, the quant guys will tell you that they can value. Risk cannot be valued, okay? Because if tomorrow the government puts a tax on oil, I mean, nobody can value that ahead of time. Very important, the watch list. We come across many ideas every day. Uh, brokers, uh, friends, uh, everybody's giving us ideas. And we are very, very strict and disciplined. We have a watch list, 300 names, all the sectors global. And this is our entry point. And it's an entry barrier for the book. Means new idea goes there if it competes with the rest of ideas. If we like the sector, if we like the idea, it goes there. And then we follow this thing for, I don't know, one quarter, two quarters, depending, because we are you know, very experienced people, some of the companies, we know them for ages, but it goes there. Any new thing goes there because new things are risk. So risk goes to the watch list. We need to, you know, look the quarter list, hear the management, talk to everybody before uh, having an opinion. And maybe we miss, we miss opportunities there. I'm going to stop there one minute. Okay, then, yeah, because I think this is an idea that, that uh, maybe is also makes us a bit different. Uh, value investor normally, struggle a little bit with commodities uh, we've been in a, you know in the commodity space for forever <laughs> for 20 years and we've been learning the the hard way how this works and now we think there is a combination of opportunities that is unique uh, let me summarize in three ideas one we have been under investing in commodities both energy metals all of them for a decade almost, since 2013. I think the peak was 2013. So heavy underinvestment for the past seven, eight years, nine years. Second, we are doing an energy transition, which means that we need to rebuild uh, a, a big part of the economy is using electricity and you know taking fossil fuels slowly out of the equation and investing in, in green energy and this will have a huge impact in the impact uh, for instance in the demand of copper or, or lithium or nickel um, and the third one is now the, the problematic uh, with, with Russia so Russia is a big producer in terms of fossil fuels is between 10 and 15 percent of the world so 10% oil, 15 gas, and also they produce 5 to 10% of most of the metals. And I'm not 
touching about refining, so huge refining industry. So these three things are making that the cycle now has a very bright future. And, you know, we set up another fund, which is called the Natural Resources. This is the uh, combination now. So we invest in equities. We apply the value style to commodities. And we invest in equities that produce this kind of stuff. So now the portfolio is 40% oil, 10% gas, and you can see the rest. So it's one third is in basically nickel, lithium, and copper. And this is the way we try to add value. So scarcity, we avoid the mergers because the mergers, in the end, the reinvestment pace is in lower marginal return. Good reserves, good assets, safer geographies, near production. We don't like startups because you, you, you can lose everything in a startup, in a mining uh, project. Good balance sheet, very important, and good managers. And yeah, basically, I wanted to touch about intrinsic values in commodities, but it's too complicated. I think we can go for the Q&A on that. And, and, uh, and we will have, uh, anyhow, uh, in September, our natural resources day on that topic. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Marcos. Thank huh? you. Uh,